Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar where we'll be taking a look at remanufacturing and how it can provide a low risk source of additional profits for your business. My name is Stephen Kennett and I look after the supply chain and waste working groups here at Two Degrees. I'm delighted to welcome our presenters today. We have Dr. Greg Lavery, CEO of Lavery Pennell and lead author of the Next Manufacturing Revolution study. We're also very fortunate to be joined by Matt Bully, Managing Director of Caterpillar Reman, who's going to give an insight into what they're doing as a business. Today's presentations will last for around 30 minutes, which will leave us with 10 to 15 minutes for questions at the end. Before we begin, I'd just like to remind everyone that you can submit questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A box on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. Just type in your question and press send, and we'll wait until the end before answering as many as we can. As an aside, if you should have any technical issues during the presentation, please use the chat box on the right-hand side to send me a message, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So without any further delay, I'd like to hand over to Greg, who will get us started with today's presentation. So over to you, Greg. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, delighted to be here and talking about manufacturing. As we say, um, it's a low resource of additional profit. So without any further ado, um, a quick introduction for who uh, we are at Lavery Pennell. Um, we're strategy advisors assisting clients in an emerging field that we find of, of increasing profitability whilst increasing sustainability. Uh, and there's not many uh, offering services in that area. Um, and we quite enjoy um, being both environmentally friendly, socially beneficial and making profits. Um, the background and genesis to this presentation uh, was a piece of work that we did uh, and, and subsequent report on it called The Next Manufacturing Revolution. Uh, that was work we did earlier this year with the University of Cambridge's Institute for Manufacturing in two degrees. Um, and the report covered uh, seven different topics around non-labour resource efficiency. Remanufacturing was a big one of those. Uh, you can see some of the other topics there. Uh, and uh, I'd refer you, if you are interested in any more detail around the subject of remanufacturing, uh, or for that matter, any of those other topics, uh, have a look at the report uh, on the next manufacturing revolution. Uh, and I'll have some references for that, but to let you know, it's also on Two Degrees uh, website, our website, and the next manufacturing revolution.org website itself. So, without any further ado, what is remanufacturing? Well, we refer to it as the process of returning an end-of-life broken or blemished product to same as new condition in a manufacturing environment. This means what you get when you purchase that piece of equipment is original equipment manufacturer performance specification and warranty as if it was a, a newly remanufactured equivalent. Uh, and this is pretty important, this definition, because we're not talking about used or second-hand. These are pieces of equipment that are uh, remanufactured in a manufacturing environment, stripped back, quality tested, and so what you're getting is uh, as good as new. The, the other key point worth uh, flagging early in this discussion is that remanufacturing isn't for everyone. Uh, and we've got a, on the slide there, uh, number three, a bit of a matrix as to where uh, all of the different circular resource flow areas um, can apply. We've all heard a lot about closed loop or the circular economy. Uh, and let's recognise that it's not every step that you can do around a circular economy isn't for everyone. Uh, and we've got here an idea of where remanufacturing, which is the third column um, there, uh, can apply uh, in textiles, uh, wood, paper, chemicals, uh, rubber plastics, uh, and various sorts of machinery. The key thing also to note on this uh, diagram here is that as we move from right, the right side of things, which is recovery such as burning uh, materials uh, in order to recover energy through recycling, through cascaded use, through, ma through manufacturing uh, and to reuse, the value of that um, end of use product uh, actually increases as you go further to the left. So remanufacturing is an area of much greater value, for example, than recycling, even though um, there's a lot of work being done on recycling. And that's a good thing, but it's nevertheless giving away value that could otherwise be recaptured. Some quick statistics for you. If you actually look across uh, what's been going on in a number of leading sectors where remanufacturing does occur, you can see there the left-hand side is how, ma how many million pounds every year uh, of remanufactured goods are being processed. Uh, and on the right-hand side, that's expressed as a, a percentage of the total subsector turnover. And you can see there that apart from pumps and compressors and perhaps industrial tooling, which have a pretty well-established remanufacturing path, Actually, 
everything else is under 2%. And the statistic across the whole of the UK manufacturing sector is that remanufacturing only represents about 1% on average of all uh, new products sold uh, in terms of value. So the way we look at that is there's a massive opportunity to turn that 1% into a significantly higher number and as per the previous diagram, capture a lot of the residual value that's left in products at the end of their uh, first use or second use, depending on how that rip cycle goes. The other thing we were keen to do is, is, is tell a little bit of a story about the economics of remanufacturing, which I'll, which I'll do right now. So in the first place, what we've plotted here on slide five is the average basic cost breakdown for manufactured goods uh, across the whole of the UK uh, manufacturing sector. And that is for every 1,000 uh, pounds, and the ratios are pretty equivalent for whether you're in, or if you're in another country, uh, it could be euros, it could be dollars. But let's say for every 1,000 pounds, roughly uh, on average 660 pounds goes to input costs, which is goods, services, raw materials, those sorts of things. Uh, 180 pounds goes to labour. Uh, and then what's left is 160 pounds of gross profit, out of which comes selling goods, selling general administrative costs uh, and other overheads, as well as the profit margin. So actually, if you look at that, the equation looks like a hell of a lot of, of money being spent on input costs uh, and relatively little being, pay, being paid out to labour. The interesting uh, thing that we found in the next manufacturing revolution has subsequently been picked up in other fora is that why is it that manufacturing focuses very hard on labour efficiency and labour productivity when there's this enormous input cost bucket that's being largely uh, not addressed? So what does remanufacturing look like? So if we move to the next slide, we can see that actually the remanufacturing equation can save you 70% of your input costs at an expense, additional expense of roughly doubling your labour. And the way to think about that is taking back an end-of-life product um, saves a hell of a lot of processing goods, raw materials, all that sort of stuff going in. 70% uh, is what the literature, uh, good practice and examples show. Uh, whereas the process takes twice as much labour because what you're effectively doing is taking back an end-of-life product or a core, uh, as, as the remanufacturers refer to it, and, and Matt, I'm sure, will speak about that a little bit later. Um, and then what you're doing is essentially uh, stripping it back, uh, test it, cleaning it, testing it, uh, disassembling all the way back to its raw components, throwing some of those components away because they're, or let's say recycle them uh, because they're not uh, up to scratch, and then reassembling that. So you can imagine a manufacturing process is actually a complete disassembly process followed by uh, a remanufacturing process. So hence double the labour. And what you can see there is that green, which is the gross profit, is one and a half times the original gross profit. And we've assumed there are 20% price discount, which is what the literature uh, and empirical evidence suggests uh, as a 20% as a price discount. Now, that 1.5 times the original gross profit increases enormously if you can capture the same 1,000 uh, pounds per unit. And that looks like what we see on slide seven there. So what can happen then is with the same cost base, if you can actually remanufacture a product and actually lease that, um, which means that a consumer is effectively paying the same as they might be for a virgin product, you can actually increase your profit from 160 to 442, which is 2.75 times that original gross profit. Hence, we say it's an opportunity for additional profits, uh, and we're pretty excited about that. And many manufacturers have, have gone down this road because the economics are incredibly compelling. Stepping then to some views, for example, what we looked at in the Next Manufacturing Revolution report was to say, well, what if um, actually three sectors chosen because they are applicable to remanufacturing, what if they actually remanufactured 50% uh, of the product that they produced in the first place? And you can see across those um, that lighter blue bar is what, what it is in terms of EBITDA and then on the right-hand side, uh, jobs, uh, and the darker blue is what it would be with that 50% remanufacturing. Uh, and the totals there are quite staggering, um, 5.6 billion in value on the left-hand side, which drops straight to profit line, uh, and on the right-hand side, 300,000 jobs, uh, which is uh, enormously beneficial for the UK society. Let me give you an example then, um, and, and Matt Bull is about to follow with uh, the Caterpillar Reman example, which is an outstanding one as well, but one you might not um, have heard of is what Sony does with their gaming consoles. 
Uh, what they were doing was uh, originally uh, when warranty repairs came back, they were having to hand over brand new uh, pieces of equipment and that required a whole uh, supply chain to get those um, to the customer and of course uh, was giving away some value. What they recognised though is that using remanufactured uh, game consoles, what they could do is have a very instantaneous like-for-like -like swap with the customer. So customer brings in a faulty gaming console that's immediately swapped for a remanufactured unit, which is going to be in roughly the same condition. So the customer's not necessarily expecting a brand new unit, but what they are expecting is uh, immediate service. And that was a key issue with um, replacing with brand new because that meant that could take a long time. There were a whole lot of checks and balances that needed to take place. So what they're able to do nowadays, immediate straight swap. And then uh, what Sony has is enormous number of, uh, of pieces of machinery uh, which require some repair, can be remanufactured or used as spare parts. The, st the statistics are quite staggering. So 85% of the consoles returned required minor repairs, 9% required more complex repair, uh, and 6% were irreparable uh, and entered into the reclamation, i.e. recycling and recovery process. And the numbers are enormous. From 2004 to 2007, that's just three years, 6.8 million parts uh, were reused from the PlayStation and PlayStation 2. So a real example there of not just adding value around saving costs, but actually value through a better customer experience, uh, which Sony was keen to do. If you're thinking then about remanufacturing, uh, there are a number of things to think about, uh, and we've captured the five most important here. Um, and those are, let's go around the cycle here. This is, this is the cycle of activities that mean that you can be successful in remanufacturing, manage your costs, and extract those higher profit levels that we talked about earlier. So the first one is control, making sure that the product, once it's sold, doesn't completely disappear, and then you have to go and find it again. That can be done in a number of ways. There are companies that lease. Uh, there are companies that um, actually offer a um, deposit return uh, scheme, and uh, hopefully Matt will tell, it, tell us about how uh, Caterpillar does it as well. Second issue is, uh, as you move around that circle, is management. Uh, that's essential to ensure that products are used to their maximum um, to provide higher value with less material input, uh, and that those products, when they come back, are actually in good, good condition uh, in order to minimise the amount of rework necessary. Reverse logistics, of course, is very important to be able to get back those, uh, those products at the end of their first life. Uh, capabilities to process, of course, you need to have the ability to strip the paints off uh, and, and analyse and, and manage those uh, products. Uh, as they come back, and then design. And design is often talked about as the most important part of remanufacturing because it has two key aspects. One is to maximise the product life uh, and the ease of the remanufacturing process. But secondly, it's also um, designs necessary to, be, to ensure that new products can reuse old components. So when you've got a, a PlayStation 4 uh, and that comes back, what can you do with, um, can, can you interchange components from a PlayStation uh, two, for example, just so that you've got that interchangeability. And the experts in this, especially in the photocopier industry, like Xerox and Fuji and Ricoh and those sorts of guys, are very good at making sure that those different uh, parts are actually interchangeable between generations of units. So uh, that's the end of the, the introduction of, of the manufacturing um, revolution and, and remanufacturing high-level overview. Uh, there's more information available at these uh, sites here, so the Labrie Pinnell site. You can give me a call at greg.labrie at labriepinnell.com. Uh, that's an email, sorry. Or you can look at the next manufacturing revolution. And of course, uh, Two Degrees uh, covers the uh, next manufacturing revolution as well for, for all of us. Um, might hand over now to Matt. Um, Stephen, are you able to hand control of the uh, console to uh, Matt in order to change slides? Yep, so Matt, you should now have control of the slide pack. Yeah, very good, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Bully. I'm the managing director for Caterpillar Reman within Europe. Um, we've got facilities here in Shrewsbury, where I am today, a facility in Chaumont in France, and a small facility at Radom in Poland. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview today. We've got 15 minutes to go through some of the principles of how we apply uh, remanufacturing. Um, we started remanufacturing at Caterpillar in 1973, and the slide you see uh, on the screen at the moment is, is our simple business model for, for overall Caterpillar, and that applies across all the industries within which we serve. 
be that mining, power generation, marine, construction, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're trying to do is, a, is seed, grow, and harvest, and where remanufacturing fits for us is, is in the harvest piece. Um, seeding the market is, is selling uh, first units, vehicles, engines into the marketplace. Um, on the basis they perform uh, well against our competitors, we would hope to grow our market share in terms of our percentage of industry sales, which is our pins side of things, in grow. And once we have that product out in the field uh, delivering as it should for our customers, what we're trying to do then is ensure that those products are serviced and supported as well as they possibly can be in terms of overall owning and operating costs. And part of that owning and operating cost equation is where the remanufacturing piece uh, comes in. So we have our uh, product life cycle and reman life cycle um, diagram here. And uh, fairly simply, as we move around the yellow side of the uh, slide, we have uh, original uh, equipment design manufacture. Product is sold to the customer and begins its, its life. It performs as it should. It is regularly maintained, hopefully. The product matures. Um, there's various servicing, oil changes, uh, some, some replacement parts in here. But typically for an engine or, or a vehicle uh, transmission, then uh, we would look for that product to come to the end of its life uh, before failure, ideally. And at that point, we hit this intersection here where we begin the, the reman life cycle. Again, the intent of this overall is around helping our customers lower their owning and operating costs and really realizing the value of their machine or engine. What we do here um, in terms of the return process, why is that important for our customers? What we do is make that um, financially uh, a good financial incentive for the customers to return that product to us through our dealer network. And so we apply to each of our remanufactured products uh, a financial value called a core deposit, and typically that is higher and sometimes up to 50% of the uh, total cost of a um, of a remanufactured part, bringing the price to an equivalent of, of new. Um, so if we were selling a, a product for say a thousand pounds, potentially the core deposit could be anything up to 500 pounds. And at the point the product is uh, fails, the customer would bring that product back to us, and that comes back into then to the remanufactured cycle. So we receive the core, we clean and strip the strip the product down. We recycle what's possible. We apply salvage techniques to certain components and we reuse others. They're remanufactured, reassembled, thoroughly tested and inspected, and then product is sold again and, and re enters the supply chain. At this intersection, the core deposit money is given back to the customer. So £500 in this example would be given to the customer at the point they return the core. So an example, just pictorially, this is typically what we would see uh, an engine come back to us like uh, in any of our remanufacturing facilities. As we've stripped the components, the advanced uh, recycling technology is, uh, is applied here. That can be anything from uh, laser cladding to twin wire arc metal spray to some machining processes, uh, welding, uh, stitch lock type uh, technology, and I'll talk a little bit about a specific example we run here in Shrewsbury in a slide or so. There are some parts that we're unable to salvage or it's uneconomical to do so, so we do add some new material. And then from a remanufacturing process, the same as we would apply within our uh, new manufactured processes, very clean, tidy, professional, high standard facilities uh, running to the same, if not better, uh, production specifications as we would see in the uh, new new facilities. What we're trying to do here is provide value for the customer. Um, so it is absolutely imperative and a distinction between remanufacturing or perhaps a refurbishment or reuse is that the reliability is absolutely key. Uh, we're not offering something that is substandard. We're not offering something that has a poorer level of performance. And as such, we offer a full warranty on all of our remanufactured components. 
the same as um, anybody who were buying a new component. In terms of availability, again, it's absolutely critical that uh, if you're in need of a replacement part, then those remanufactured components are available and on the shelf when you'd like to purchase them. And therefore, we have a within our logistics loop, we have distribution centers which are stocking our remanufactured components. Um, as we are delivering products into our dealer network across the world on a daily basis anyway, the core comes back to our dealers and therefore the vehicle that's delivered um, product or component to the dealer is able to collect the core and bring that back to our distribution centers. Um, Greg explained in the earlier slides around the uh, pricing differential then that we were able to get a, a large piece of our raw material uh, through our core returning into the system. Um, and as we strip everything down and have some very thorough inspection processes and non-destructive testing, uh, material quality, crack propagation are all part of our manufacturing process within the facilities. Um, again, as we strip product down, we're able to incorporate some of the latest engineering standards, and often we're the first port of call for any uh, durability issues on a new design, and therefore we can include those and feedback to, to design improvements in terms of ongoing uh, product support and reliability. Uh, today we've got 17 facilities across the globe. Um, we've got 2.5 million square feet of manufacturing space and about 4,200 employees. Um, if you look at our sustainability report from 2012, the sort of scale of the uh, operation we run, um, we uh, took back or brought back in core of around about 171 million pounds of material or 77, approximately 77 million kilograms of uh, material in 2012. So it's uh, quite a sizable business. In terms of the types of products we offer, whilst I've spoken about um, engines and transmissions, uh, there are lots of ancillary pieces of equipment um, that are associated with engine components, drivetrain and hydraulics, as well as uh, electrical components as well now, starters and alternators, uh, engine control units, etc. So there's a, an example of the types of products that we remanufacture. Specifically then, an example of how does that actually work in practice. Um, we, ha we have a, a rail uh, engine, a horizontal Perkins engine we supply into the UK and have done for uh, 10 or plus years. And uh, they run on the, those uh, range of commuter trains with a, a vehicle fleet of about 340. And these uh, engines uh, are warranted for 400,000 miles before they require remanufacturing. And we've remanufactured about 120 units a year over the last 10 years. It's very important for our customers in terms of their reliability and owning and operating costs that they have a reliable solution. Um, and in terms of their economic model, they're looking for those uh, trains to continue run, to run for another 15 years. Um, originally, uh, on the engine block for that, uh, that rail engine, um, we were able to salvage those components by taking a, a machining process and uh, taking a skim across the top of the block. Um, but what that would only gave us was a maximum of four lives, and in the early part of the, uh, this product life, that was acceptable. Uh, but we got to a point where we only had a limited number of uh, engine blocks remaining in stock, and uh, the supplier uh, was no longer found it economically viable to supply those blocks. Uh, without replacing the tooling, um, and so we were challenged uh, with the engineering team to come up with a, a potential new method of uh, salvaging those blocks. And in doing some investigation a, on the machining processes and investment in some technology and uh, a minor redesign of the uh, engine pistons, uh, we were able to increase the salvage lives then from 4 to 10. We have prevented for the next uh, 15 years of uh, train life, uh, we've eliminated using an additional 90 tons of iron in terms of casting new engine blocks and uh, significant energy savings as well for, for uh, not requiring to, to cast those new blocks, as well as the cost advantage for the customer. So an example here um, from a number of years ago of an analysis that was conducted for cylinder head versus new um, in terms of some comparisons of not only the material usage but 
additional energy and water and landfill improvements. Um, whilst we could debate some of the uh, uh, calculations here one way or another uh, in terms of an order of magnitude, then that gives us a very good indication of not only is this good for our customers, but it's also a very good business in terms of the uh, environmental impact. So from our point of view, it's a, it's, it's a very good solution for our customers to be able to look at their uh, owning and operating costs. Um, we absolutely cannot compromise on quality, and therefore the engine test standards, the transmission standards, the, the performance criteria are as good as new and sometimes better as we're able to include uh, the current engineering standards. Um, the availability is key and therefore that allows us uh, for our customers not to uh, be impacted in terms of how they use the machines to make money and we minimize their downtime. We're able to design for remanufacture so as we look at new product design we can build those characteristics in and uh, because we have the scale across the globe it allows us with the uh, money we're able to generate for us to invest in uh, new technologies, we're constantly looking for new technologies to apply and how do we salvage more and more product. Um, that gets slightly more difficult, um, but equally we've got some very clever technology to allow us to do that. So in summary, um, we, we're looking to allow free trade across, across the globe. We don't want to have a facility in every location in the world. Uh, we need to make sure that the economics of that stand up but uh, our customers recognize the value and uh, we enjoy market pull. It's a sustainable and green business and uh, it allows us to, uh, to generate profits, which is a good thing as well. So it's good for our customers, good for business, good for the environment and, and good for economies. There's an awful lot more detail out there. If, uh, if anybody would be interested to uh, go and have a look at some of the statistics included here, then uh, there are some uh, web addresses there for you to be able to go and uh, find out some more information. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Matt. That was a fascinating insight there. So we'll go um, straight into the Q&A session now, and we've had lots of questions come in. Um, Greg, maybe you, you could take these first couple, and I think it's really just about um, clarifying some of the definitions. But somebody's asking, um, what's the difference between remanufacturing and refurbishment? And also, what's the difference between cascaded use and recycling? Yeah, okay. So, so cascaded use, let's start with that one. So r r cascaded use is where you take a product at the end of its first life and use it for something that's not quite as high quality, but nevertheless is um, a, a use. So it's, it's for instance, um, taking, a, um, let's say, concrete and using that as a road-based material. So it's not as good as original concrete, but you're downgrading that a little bit. Um, recycling is more taking that product and breaking it right back to its basics and putting it back together again. So, for instance, uh, plastic recycling actually sort of takes all the molecules, melts them back down in a chemical process and, and builds that plastic back up again. Um, remanufacturing versus refurbishment. Now, there's lots of words out there. Um, technically, refurbishment can be done in a manufacturing environment to create a better quality product. Uh, or as good a quality product as the original manufactured goods. But there's a lot of also um, areas of refurbishment that are not, not so good quality. And I think Matt put his finger on it when he says, look, for Caterpillar, it's all about are you getting the same warranty, which means that your product's as good as a from virgin material uh, equivalent. And that's, that's what we see as a key difference between reman and refurb. Great. Thanks, Greg. Um, next question up. Um, <clears throat> the issue of reverse logistics is the cost especially for low-cost products. Um, can you maybe give some thoughts around that? Yeah, let, let, me, let me have a go at that. The, you're absolutely right in that no matter what your product is, in order to get into a remanufacturing business, uh, you need to step through how you're going to do each of those five steps that I showed you in that cycle diagram. And reverse logistics can be very expensive. On the other hand, it might not be. So take an example where you have a distribution system that takes your products right through to a customer, uh, which means that trucks are going back to your distribution centres uh, with less on them than they went with. Um, if the customer can return the product to where they purchased it or through that distribution network, then actually that might not cost you very much for that reverse logistics. If, on the other hand, um, you, you produce and you're not in control of the logistics um, and then you have to go out and 
send a truck around to every customer premise, it could be very expensive. So our advice is um, make sure you have a think about how you're going to do each of those steps and then build a, a solid business case around that to show that you're making a decent uh, profit out of it uh, and that you can afford each of the steps. Great. Thanks, Greg. Um, Matt, question here for you. Um, what arrangements are made for recollection from customers and how do you know at which point during the, the life cycle of the um, plant to, to kind of intervene? So we, we have a very close relationship with our um, dealer network and our dealer network are really the, the front line within territory wherever our equipment is being used. And so our dealers are the experts in terms of providing the, the service and support for uh, oil analysis and performance analysis. Um, we've recently uh, introduced a, a product called Product Link on all our uh, equipment as well. And therefore, we've got real-time data of fuel consumption, durability cycles, etc., to give us, again, more data to be able to uh, make the analysis of when is it appropriate to then start to uh, decommission a piece of equipment and, and bring it to uh, back in for the remanufacturing process. But typically our, our dealers will do a first and second service uh, of an engine or transmission. Um, and then typically the uh, economics work that we would do the third and fourth uh, life of a, a product, if you like, through through the remanufacturing cycle. But mm -hmm. the, the, the key indicator for an engine really is on the, the oil sampling and the, the particles which are uh, evident within within the oil sample. Thanks, Matt. And a follow-on question for that. Someone's asking, how many times could an engine block be remanufactured? So, a very good question. Um, and the example that I use here in Shrewsbury is the one I've shared here for uh, the rail engine. Um, some of the engines that we have here have been through our remanufacturing process now five and six times. And so, with a 400,000-mile warranty on those, they've done you know, nearly 2.5 million miles. Um, and we anticipate with the uh, change of salvage process that I talked about, they will continue and do that amount again. So we'll be up to 10 or 12 uh, lives through the remanufacturing cycle, which is a significant advantage uh, compared to having to buy a new engine uh, each time uh, it had come to the end of its life. Thanks, Matt. Um, Greg, a, a more general one here, but um, someone's asking what, what are some of the potential pitfalls to look out for when you're considering um, a remanufacturing approach? Yeah, that, that's, that's a difficult question because there are a lot of steps involved here. Um, I, I'll reiterate what I said earlier. The, the key thing is to actually think very carefully about each step and think through the whole circular uh, supply chain. So Matt put up that sort of figure eight on its side or that infinity diagram that sort of showed each step. Uh, what Caterpillar has done really well is thought through how each of those steps is going to be executed uh, so that they all join up uh, and then feed back into the design process. And so for, a, for, for someone contemplating remanufacturing, thinking through each of those and the different options, for example, uh, how do you collect the product? Well, that can be done in a whole bunch of different ways. We've talked about some of them. But thinking through the most cost-effective and most reliable way to do that is really important and then putting a, a, a price against what that will cost in order that you can build up a business case sort of step by step to be able to say, okay, all up, what does this look like for us? Um, and then I, I suppose there's an even trickier bit that says, look, what do we need to do for our business model? Um, and if I'll give you an example, uh, Fuji Xerox uh, in Australia actually were one of the first companies to, some 20 years ago to start remanufacturing. Their issue was... Um, selling brand new photocopiers was a very expensive exercise for them compared with low cost um, Asian produced uh, photocopiers from, from lower cost nations. They were importing photocopiers from Japan um, that were very high spec and very expensive. And what they, just, what they thought was why is it we've got all these old photocopiers in Australia and, we haven't, and we're still importing uh, new photocopiers from Japan, what can we do around that? And what, the, what they got into was the manufacturing. Um, and what they discovered then when they started to say, well, how can we keep better control um, of our photocopies? They said, well, let's move from a straight selling of a $5,000 photocopier, moving to a leasing solution that says, well, look, this, this, this saves a customer a hell of a lot of money up front because photocopies are very expensive new. Plus, it enables them to keep a better eye on those photocopiers. And so nowadays, they sell, they sell a leasing product which is actually also including service and maintenance. So literally you get a guy knocking the front door saying, hey, can I come in and fix your photocopier? 
to which the response is, well, it's not broken, to which the re repair guy goes, well, just wait a minute, because they've actually got some very smart analytics in their systems that mean that actually they know the bits that are going to break first roughly when that's going to happen, so they can maintain those very efficiently. And you can imagine for a customer there's a value proposition there as well, which means no downtime, which means the customer doesn't have to make the call out, and it just saves everyone a whole lot of hassle. So the, the second big issue once you've thought around the cycle is, well, does that actually change your business model? Um, and that can be very uh, challenging for some management teams, but nevertheless also very rewarding uh, if you get that right. Great. Thanks, Greg. Um, Matt, there's, there's a couple of questions here for you. Um, so you mentioned that some materials cannot be salvaged, and um, the person is asking, they'd be interested to find out why materials cannot be salvaged. For example, are there specific material types and what happens to them instead? And um, a follow-up to that is, um, are you using this remanufacturing to justify redesign and different material choices? Okay. Um, so in terms of the, the first piece around some uh, materials cannot be salvaged. So what we look at is the economics of the technology at which we apply to a particular component. So, for example, the engine block. And we look at the value of that component, um, of what's the, what's the cost for us to purchase a new one against the investment required to apply the technology and any additional material to be able to salvage that component. And so sometimes at this stage, um, typically the smaller the component, uh, the less material is in there, therefore the less value it has. Um, sometimes with our current technology, it's not always possible to economically salvage some of those components. But what happens at that point then is that we, we segregate those um, in terms of a, a waste stream in terms of true remanufacturing, but they then go back to our uh, material foundries and, and casting and uh, go back into the process that way. So it, it goes from remanufacturing down through the cascaded route and the recycling route as opposed to a straight uh, salvage capability. So we can um, salvage an awful lot of materials, but equally things like gaskets, uh, O-rings, uh, sealing components, um, to be destroyed as we take the components apart and therefore it's not possible to salvage some of those materials. Great, thank you Matt. Um, Greg, there's one here for you. Um, are there currently any government policies in place that support remanufacturing and could, should there be? And what can government do to encourage the practice? Yeah, re really good question. I actually saw a draft of a paper that's coming out um, shortly from the Tories on, it's called 2020 um, Commission on uh, re on Manufacturing. And, and interestingly, this is one of their conclusions, is that the government's actually not doing anything to support remanufacturing. In fact, some of policies right now in government are actually uh, hurting remanufacturing. So, some, some quite simple things like the definition of a product once it re reaches the end of its first use. Um, calls that waste um, and that must be called a second-hand product if that's ever sold, which actually creates all sorts of problems with um, the image of remanufacturing because it's, it has to be deemed because the law says as a second-hand product and various issues like that. Um, so there are a whole bunch of issues around that, yes, that need to be addressed. Uh, fortunately, it looks as though there are some members of government that are actually starting to think about this. So hopefully we'll see more encouragement of the whole area of non labor resource productivity. Uh, and specifically remanufacturing. Because, I mean, we, we've all seen a lot of companies devoting a lot of time to diverting material from landfill. We've all heard the term sort of zero waste to landfill, and a lot of factories have already achieved that. Um, however, diverting from landfill to, to burn a product is actually not as good potentially as the whole remanufacturing process where you're adding more value there. Thanks, Greg. Another question we had in was, are there any legal considerations which need to be considered. So is that kind of what you were alluding to in, in the answer to that question? Yeah, in part. And, and I'd love for, for Matt to give his uh, perspective as well on some of the legal uh, hassles that he faces day to day uh, in, the re in the remanufacturing world. Yeah, um, there, there's some technical pieces around um, where a product has been used and uh, just the, the legal environmental compliance of transporting product with oils and, and uh, other fluids inside. So there's that side of things. But on a, um, a definition uh, piece, 
uh, particularly as you start to look at accounting practices from country to country. Um, it's not economically sustainable for us to have a remanufacturing facility in every country all over the world. We're trying to look at uh, an efficient uh, factory environment and therefore, uh, be it a fuel injector or a large engine, they have different requirements and different uh, economics around those. What we run into in terms of the remanufacturing definition issue is as you cross uh, borders from one country to another, um, the definition of is this a waste, is it a, a remanufactured product, and how does that get treated from a taxation point of view can be a penalty which prevents you then selling remanufactured product in that country for the future. So uh, there's an element of getting the old material out of a region, and equally there's a definition piece of a used component that's been remanufactured going back into the country and attracting uh, additional taxation which uh, pro you know would dissuade the customer from purchasing that product um, if you if we could break down some of those barriers we would have easier flow and therefore a, a more level playing field for uh, remanufacturers to come into the market great thanks Matt so I'm conscious of time but I think we've probably got enough for, for a couple more questions um, so Greg I don't know if you want to tackle this one. Do consumer electronics such as smartphones need a collection infrastructure working properly first for remanufacturing to be viable? And might this not be viable for individual manufacturers? Yeah, I, you've, that, that's a very good question. It's touched on a couple of issues. Um, infrastructure, no matter what the product um, is needed, um, because broadly it doesn't exist. Uh, and, and part of the need for that is the second part of the question, which is it's very difficult for an individual manufacturer to set up an infrastructure and then have that running in parallel with others because that's just lacking economies of scale. Um, so there is definitely a need to sort of work together. Now that creates all sorts of other legal headaches. Uh, and the minute you go and talk to your legal department and say, hey, I'd like to work with a competitor, they say, no, you can't do that. That's anti-competitive behaviour and that, that'll get us into trouble. So that can be squashed very quickly. However, Actually, there are ways to work together, uh, and there's some interesting initiatives. Uh, Biz uh, is actually, the department is very supportive of uh, those sort of collaborations, especially when there are social, environmental, and, and overall economic uh, benefits. So there's all sorts of opportunities there. Mobile phones very specifically are quite difficult because there are so many very, very small um, um, trace elements of some very important and expensive rare earth metals in there, and they are notoriously difficult to extract. However, um, if you took a more systematic approach to it, there are ways to actually design products so that, that makes it, so you can make that separation a whole lot easier. Um, and, and our view um, from our work in remanufacturing is that, um, and, and helping companies actually think through how you would set up a remanufacturing session, uh, business, our view is that mobile phones actually haven't really gone back to the fundamental design side of things and said, how would we design a mobile phone to be remanufactured properly? Uh, and what might that look like. So I, I think mobile phones are a long way off, partly because it, they are one of the more difficult pieces of equipment to do that with. Great. Thanks, Greg. Um, and the final question here, Matt, I don't know if you want to, to go first with this, but um, do customers have a perception that remanufactured product is of lower value than a brand new one, and how do you overcome this? So the, the simple, quick answer is yes. <laughs> um, so the, and, and I think that's where some of the definition uh, around remanufactured, refurbished, reconditioned, reused uh, is very important. Um, and that's partly why I'm very keen to do these sorts of sessions and, and talk to as many people as possible about what is remanufacturing compared to uh, reuse or refurbished. So there is a perception of that. Um, and it's because remanufacturing is not very well known. Um, so if it's been used before, there's an initial doubt that, well, you know, what, there must be something wrong with it. Um, however, uh, how do we overcome that? Um, we apply the warranty. Um, once you've taken away the core deposit value, actually we're offering product at 50, 60, 70 percent of the price of new with the same performance levels, fuel consumption, emissions, uh, power output, and therefore, in some respects, why wouldn't you choose a remanufactured product? Because you're getting a, a price preference and the same performance and the same warranty. Um, how do we do that? 
every single day we must deliver on our quality requirements, our performance requirements, and our availability requirements. Um, the day we fall down on that, the day the customer gets a question in their mind, and therefore they may potentially not come back and, and buy from us again. So absolutely critical, but it's about delivering on our promises and uh, doing that every single day. Yeah, and if, if I can add to that, so what the photocopier industry has done has said, actually customers don't care as long as they've got a clean white piece of equipment that works very well and looks modern and high tech. So if you look at the design specifications, for instance, for photocopiers, every little groove and chamfer is actually designed with very clear detailing so that it can be cleaned. So that when they take a photocopier back and remanufacture it, it comes back absolutely spotless to, to the second to the next customer. And in a leasing model, if someone is effectively lending you a photocopier, if it works and it looks new, then who knows actually what's inside that box, as long as it keeps performing um, to the level that Matt talked about. So actually there are ways around that. Uh, and, and in that leasing case, actually you can effectively charge full price um, for a product that is remanufactured and thereby achieve those even higher pro uh, profit margins. Fantastic. Thanks, Greg. Um, so that's all we've got time for for now, but I'd like to thank Greg and Matt for their time today and for getting through so many questions, and also for everyone who joined us for this webinar. Just to remind you all, a recording of the webinar and the presentation slides will be archived on the Two Degrees platform. So I hope you found today interesting and useful, and you'll be able to join us in the future for further webinars. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>